Good morning, this is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Illinois Authors. And today we're really delighted to be joined by a terrific investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune, uh, Ray Long, who's also written a really important book called The House That Madigan Built. Uh, it's a wonderful account of the triumphs and travails of Speaker Madigan, and also serves as almost a primer on Illinois politics over the last 40 years. So it's really a terrific book. Ray has an interesting background. is from Winchester, Illinois, which is about 50 miles west of Springfield. Uh, went to Eastern Illinois, graduated from Sangamon State. Then he entered the Public Affairs Reporting Program, which is a terrific reporting program that actually Paul Simon helped create about half a century ago. Uh, Ray's had a great career. He's been with the Alton Telegraph, Peoria Journal Star, Chicago Sun-Times, Associated Press, and the Tribune for many years. He's been twice the finalist for a Pulitzer Prize and joins us from his uh, home in Chicago. Good morning, Ray. Hi, John. Thank you for having me on. Great. Well, tell us about growing up in Winchester and then the journalism bug. When you were growing up, was this a career that you always were kind of looking at or tell us about that? Well, I'm thankful that my parents have subscribed to newspapers or Jacksonville papers, Springfield paper. I delivered the Post Dispatch when I was a kid. So I did uh, have a good familiarity with papers. And I grew up in a, a small town, had a great small town life. My dad was the principal of the grade school. My mom was a, a teacher at the blind school in Jacksonville. And she taught uh, public if uh, she she taught PE and uh, it was a, a, a public job they b both held public uh, positions and so uh, they came up with a solid upbringing where they tried to teach me right from wrong and I tried to carry those values through when I was in Winchester uh, going to Springfield was the uh, great uh, big city that I'd, I'd go to, and I'd try to be the first one to spot the Capitol Dome when we were riding over in the car. And then, uh, you know, years later, I tried to be the first one to write about the scoops in the Capitol that I was working in. So it kind of came full circle. Well, so you started with, uh, I think, uh, from from the, the public affairs reporting program, you did an internship at Alton, and yeah. then you worked for a time in Peoria. Uh, as I mentioned in our emails, you know, I'm from Peoria and grew up reading the Peoria Journal Star, and I'm interested in just your experience with the Peoria Journal Star, and also one of your mentors there, a guy, by the, a gentleman by the name of Bill O'Connell, who was right. this kind of legendary reporter. I remember just as a kid reading a, a bit about Springfield, and there was always, you know, Mr. O'Connell was writing uh, an article. So talk about the Peoria paper and then your your experience with Bill. Well, it was a great uh, time to be in journalism in Peoria. Uh, they covered 19 counties and there was always something really newsworthy happening around town. It was a good mix of blue collar and white collar jobs and just created all kinds of terrific stories. Um, I got my first big break there. I started out as a copy editor, but then started working weekends uh, as a reporter and eventually moved full time. But my first big break, like I said, was when I covered uh, the 205 day UAW cat strike in 82 and 83. And that was a, a learning experience all along, lots of pressure. Everybody in Peoria cared about every word I wrote on every, every day of that strike. And um, I had to work sources like crazy and really developed as a, a reporter there. I moved on to uh, County Beat and uh, parachuted in a little bit to help in Springfield. Um, I had great editors on, on the, the desk. And as you said, my mentor there was Bill O'Connell, who was legendary. He's just a fantastic reporter. He understood why people did what they did in the legislature, why legislation was going one way or another. And he taught me to write so that um, I could bring it home to his uh, characters that he fictionalized in his mind, thinking of Grace and Elmer riding the bus or going down to the uh, Walgreens and talking about what the stories were of the day. And so he tried to keep them in mind and he tried to keep Peorians in mind. And he taught uh, us really to care about what people care about and not just what the politicians 
are doing or what they think, et cetera, but really uh, a way to transmit the complicated things that happen in Springfield into language that Joe Lunchbox can understand, Grace and Elmer can understand. Great. Well, you uh, you talk about the the beat at the Illinois State House, and you call it the greatest beat on planet Earth, a never ending mosh pit of sophisticated, complex, and raucous politics. And then you say it was a marvelous place to learn. And I remember when I was starting out, you know, there was this really, really large, bustling, aggressive. Uh, press corps in Springfield um, and, and you that was the world that you entered. So talk about that uh, that beat. Well, there were dozens of full-time reporters there all trying to scoop each other every day and uh, some did better than others and you tried to learn from all and everybody got a piece of the action um, and everybody could uh, claim scoops of their own but it was hotly uh, competitive and everybody wanted to know what was going on behind the scenes and write the best stories. So it was a, it was a combination of daily journalism, uh, in-depth reporting, investigative journalism, and analysis. And so everything was happening there. I, I think that you see these big ideas coming down from the city of Chicago. You see these big ideas coming from rural Illinois and suburban uh, Chicago, and they all come together in this big montage of ideas, and they have to reach compromise if they want something to be done. They uh, try to uh, show how they can uh, out-politicize each other, and they used legislation to help their politics, and they used politics to help their legislation. It was just an incredible time to be there, and Jim Thompson, probably one of the smartest governors this state has ever seen, was the governor when I first got there, and uh, that just really uh, put together a, a great learning experience. We saw uh, Madigan on the rise. He was minority leader Madigan when I first started there. Uh, and uh, he eventually became speaker. And uh, there was uh, a lot of maneuvering that the city folks would have to do to get the downstaters to come along and, and vice versa. So uh, all these different things were happening. It was just an incredible uh, learning experience it's also well, one reason I call it the greatest beat on planet Earth is because all these great different ideas come together and all big stories eventually come through Springfield, whether they're city based in Chicago or based in Peoria. Uh, the big tales really have to go through Springfield to get the jobs done. I think, Ray, another piece of this, and I remember from my time there, is just the accessibility. I mean, when you walk in the Capitol, you're walking down the hall and here comes, you know, Jim Thompson or uh, Secretary yeah. of State Jim Edgar or, you know, George Ryan, Lieutenant Governor, or Mike Madigan with the entourage probably, but just the accessibility. In fact, the, I recall reporters were just kind of situated right on the floor of the General Assembly almost, a little bullpen or something. So talk about that piece of it. Right. There were press boxes on each side of the House, uh, one on the Republican side and one on the Democratic side. There were so many re reporting outfits that you had assigned seats on each side. And and um, there would be uh, little press conferences or little uh, uh, scrums with uh, legislators that would break out from time to time when you'd pull some lawmaker off the floor to try to explain uh, what his position was or what just happened or talk about why his bill failed or passed. And uh, it was the same on the Senate side, too. There were press boxes on each side, and you generally could get uh, a hold of a lawmaker if you uh, needed to talk to them. So it really is uh, another uh, place where you can truly be a daily watchdog, uh, an investigative watchdog. You just have uh, a real close feel to what's going on in government. And you are able to relay that to the people back home who are reading or watching or listening to your reports. Well, let's talk about Mike Matt again. Um, and the, the, I mean, just to kind of, uh, you know, brief people, I mean, he was, uh, you know, from the southwest side of Chicago, comes from a family with, I think his dad was active in politics. He was sort of a protege of, of, of Mayor Daley. 
um, graduate of Notre Dame, Loyola Law, uh, was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention in 69, elected the House in 70, um, became Democratic leader in 81, and then from 83 to 2021, was a speaker that whole time except for one two year period. So so those are kind of the big picture parameters. But but as someone who watched him over the years, what was he really like? I mean, in t the words you use in your book, uh, quoting others, but words like taciturn and acerbic and uh, kind of aloof, distant. Sketch sketch out Mike Madigan, the Mike Madigan that you watch for all those years. Well, he could be all of those actually at different times, depending on the time and depending on what information he may have wanted out or what he didn't want to talk about or whether he wanted to talk to the press or not talk to the press. Sometimes he would go silent for what seemed like months. Uh, sometimes he would talk to you because he had a message he wanted to get out. Sometimes he wouldn't talk to you because there was a story he didn't like that you did. And uh, But he was, uh, there's this kind of a myth out there that he was never uh, accessible. But for the folks who covered him day to day, he could be uh, caught in between uh, bill uh, votes or uh, at on the floor or in committee. Um, sometimes uh, he was in a hurry to get away from us. He would answer the questions he wanted to answer. He'd answer them the way he'd want to answer them. You could ask the same question in different ways to try to get more clarity. He'd clarify as much as he wanted and he wouldn't clarify anymore. Uh, he was a, a guy who uh, really tried to uh, tilt everything his way when he was looking at legislation or when he was talking to the press. Well, and, and he had such an intricate power base. I mean, he had, of course, the 13th Ward, which was his his home and his kind of political base, the 22nd Legislative District, um, you know, as speaker for all these years, chairman of the Illinois Democratic Party. Um, was it essential to have all of these pieces in place for him to, to to exert as much influence? I mean, did he overextend himself by all of these sort of uh, commitments and, and responsibilities? Well, he, he once said in an interview that he he wanted to be a powerful speaker, that you could make a choice uh, when you became speaker to be a powerful speaker or not be a powerful speaker, and he chose to be. And of course, that's kind of in the style of of Mayor Richard J. Daley, his, his uh, mentor. And uh, he really, Madigan was able to really expand upon the many, many uh, areas so that he could control the, the legislation and he could control the politics. And so he could be a guy who would uh, help legislation get through if he, if he thought it was good for his team or uh, amend it so it would be better for his team of uh, Democrats. Or he could uh, be a guy who would also black legislation that he viewed as bad for Democrats or bad for his allies like labor or trial lawyers, et cetera. So um, he was a very uh, calculated uh, politician. And he did need to reach out to have that big, powerful grip that he did. Not only did he have uh, the allies in labor and in uh, the legislator legislators that were Democrats, but he also had staff that was uh, dedicated and uh, you know sworn to secrecy that so they wouldn't be talking to reporters, and also um, that they would uh, graduate eventually from. Uh, Madigan's staff and then become lobbyists. And then he would have lobbyists who would be out there who could then turn to help him out in during the political season, help him raise money, help him staff campaigns. So it was all one big orchestrated effort to keep the speaker in power. And that's what it was his bottom line was to maintain the majority in the House so he could re remain as speaker. Yeah, the question, as you point out in your book, is that a lot of times he was pressed on, okay, what kind of Democrat are you? Are you moderate, liberal, conservative? And he would say, I'm a Democrat. Um, but you also say that there are sort of three kind of core things that he seemed most focused on. Um, one was to protect the city of Chicago. Second, to protect the Democratic Party, uh, particularly the House Caucus. 
Um, and third, the kind of the prerogatives of the General Assembly vis-a-vis -vis the governor. Talk about those kind of three realms that he seemed to be most committed to, to protect. Right. And uh, in the foreword done by uh, the great former reporter and uh, former director of the public affairs reporting <laughs> program at, at uh, UIS, Charlie Wheeler, uh, wrote uh, in, in a great, uh, it, he really expanded on those. And uh, he viewed Madigan as a guy who uh, had his eye on protecting Chicago overall, its interests, and um, his uh, what he called the institutions of, of uh, Chicago that would range from everything from O'Hare to the CTA to the art museum, the kinds of things that uh, uh, are important to the city. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, it was also included saving the White Sox at one time. But um, he also um, looked at, at some of the broader issues in the legislature and made sure that legislators understood that uh, they were a co-equal branch of government. Uh, they were not servants for the governor. They were their own uh, branch of government and they had their equal say. And so he didn't want them to be treated like, uh, you know, servants or, or uh uh, operators just for the governor, but they were uh, ones who could form their own legislation, they could form their own ideas, and they could do what they thought was right and fight the governor if they felt that it, the governor was wrong. Let's talk about his style of governing. Um, the word secretive is used a lot. I mean, it seemed like it was a, a, a relatively closed circle. I mean, one of the images that you depict in the book is him in the uh, the speaker in the evenings going to a Springfield restaurant, Saputo's, you know, with a kind of a corner uh, corner area. Uh, with his, you know, inner circle. And I suspect a lot of people just did not stroll in and say, can I sit down and join you, Mr. <laughs> Speaker? So it seems like, I mean, that even kind of evokes a kind of closed world. And then also, I mean, if you, if you could talk about that, and then also your sense of, of him as just a strategist, thinking in the long term, particularly every 10 years in redistricting. And he always had his eye on that date and knew what the consequences of that exercise were going to be. Well, uh, it was it was a lot like uh, one might say all about winning. He wanted to win the speakership and then he could control the rest of the process. And part of winning the speakership, part of uh, keeping Democrats in charge uh, was that long view where if you can draw the lines of the uh, every time the district boundaries are redrawn every 10 years after the census, then you can tilt them in ways that would help you uh, have more Democrats, a bigger majority, and a group of Democrats who could vote for you to be speaker. Uh, keeping the speakership and voting for his rules on how to run the House were key, uh, key votes for him, major votes for him. And he wanted uh, the lawmakers on his side of the aisle to be voting for those uh, things, him as speaker, of course, more than anything. And um, his ability to look at uh, issues as they came up and know whether this could impact a lawmaker in Southern Illinois or know whether it could impact a, a lawmaker who's having a tough uh, race uh, also played a role into what he did. And so he was, he was a, there's no doubt he was a, a hard worker. He was most likely and probably, and almost everyone will say that he was the hardest working legislator there. So he would be up early and uh, then he would work hard all day and he would work toward uh, the goal of keeping, uh, keeping the power. Well, one of the kind of the defining moments of his speakership, and I guess it's hard to say that since it was over 40 years, but his, you know, I guess maybe it's relatively recent, his battle with Governor Rahner mm -hmm. became an almost epic struggle. It was, you know, a four year period from 2015 to 2019, I guess culminating 2017 and this 
this long, long budget stalemate then, which in the end, Madigan put together a budget and was able to, bring, to persuade uh, 15 Republicans initially and then 11 in the veto override to support it. And, and, and just like at one point, uh, Madigan was talking about his battle with Rauner and he calls it this unbelievable struggle, which is pretty, pretty, uh, um, a pretty exalted language for Mike Madigan. Talk about the Rauner Madigan dynamic and and just the, the particularly the the budget battle that was so protracted and so consequential. Well, interestingly, uh, Madigan even talked about that in a deposition that he gave in a civil case, um, and he talked about how Rauner had pulled him into a meeting or they had met at the executive mansion early on, short a few weeks after Rauner had been uh, inaugurated. And uh, Rauner outlined what he called a turnaround agenda. And that was basically uh, an agenda that really would have reached, really would have shifted rather, the dynamics, the ideology of the state of Illinois. Remember, this is a, a state where the House and Senate are controlled by Democrats, not just by a small margin, but by super majorities. And so um, when Rauner came in and made all these kind of anti, not kind of, but anti-union uh, proposals and uh, tried to turn Illinois into a Wisconsin-like right-to-work state of mind, it just didn't sit well with Madigan. Madigan told uh, Rauner that he wouldn't support those kinds of changes. And uh, then Rauner came out immediately and started uh, throwing anti-Madigan uh, ads out uh, by the millions of dollars and attacking Madigan uh, personally and attacked um, the Madigan machine, everything about it, and called uh, the speaker corrupt without offering proof to show that he he uh, could back that up. And so this, uh, you know, upset Madigan obviously, and they fought to this incredible stalemate. Uh, not having a budget done one year is is. Uh, unheard of if it goes on a full year without a budget, but it went two years, something that you don't see anywhere else in the country. As a result, the, the state's debt rose to around 15 to $17 billion. That's almost half of the operating budget in the state of Illinois. And it was hurting the state uh, because the, the uh, bond houses were uh, causing the credit ratings to crater. And so Illinois uh, already had a big debt and has a big debt from its pension uh, obligations that it has it shorted its pensions for so many years that they're in a, a world of hurt, somewhere like $140 billion debt. It's the worst funded pension system in the country. And so when you have all these, uh, efforts at play and really hardball politics where neither neither Madigan didn't want to capitulate and and Rauner didn't want to capitulate uh, and Rauner expected negotiations to be ones where you would give on some uh, of his ideas that would never have passed in the legislature. And uh, he was pushing uh, ideas like right to work. At right to work had failed when George Ryan was the speaker in 1981. So these kinds of things could not have happened. They weren't appreciated by Democrats overall, and they weren't appreciated by a lot of Republicans too. And as you said, eventually Madigan was able to put together a, a, a coalition of Democrats and Republicans to pass a budget, pass an income tax increase, and start refunding government and getting it at toward, back toward where it uh, was getting some form of better stability, more accurate, and more uh, strong, stronger uh, fiscal stability. We've read you have a wonderful chapter on pensions in your book, and it's, I would urge our listeners, it's just a wonderful primer on just the issue in Illinois. But to me, what was most interesting was just 
the, the kind of different approaches that um, Speaker Madigan and Senate President John Cullerton had. Yeah. Um, and, and Madigan had a, a kind of a more sweeping agenda, but w was aware of the constitutional issues, but he, he thought that the end he could put together a big package that would get at least four vo votes on the Illinois Supreme Court. Cullerton was skeptical, had took a different approach, said, you know, you can have this great plan, but if, if the Supreme Court overrules it, we get nothing. And in the end, you say, um, you know, there was actually some modest changes done in 2010, but you said they blew their chance for the big one, speaking of Cullerton and Madigan. Talk briefly, I know you've mentioned earlier dimensions, but talk a little bit more about, about, about maybe the differences between Cullerton and Madigan in this realm. Well, they both uh, wanted to to or at least uh, said publicly and pushed publicly plans to try to address the pension uh, problem because every year it, it just keeps getting worse and every year the lawmakers are having to play catch up because prior lawmakers and governors did not fund the pensions well enough and it's it's like interest builds when you owe money the, the amount of money you owe just keeps building. So uh, Madigan uh, had a pretty severe uh, way to try to cut back the, uh, the pensions and, uh, and uh, give lower benefits overall so that they would increase at, at a slower pace. Cullerton had actually worked with major uh, union groups and tried to negotiate and did negotiate a plan that they found was acceptable, even though it would give them probably lesser opportunities for the type of benefits they received and were scheduled to receive. They were giving them a choice to try to take different styles of, of uh, their pension, whether their health care would be included, whether they wanted to to continue their 3% annual uh, COLAs. But what happened was, uh, and that would have saved less money than uh, Madigan's plan. And I wanna say that, and my, the numbers escape me, but it was about a third as, a, uh, as much as what Madigan wanted uh, to take. And Madigan eventually won out, they did make some changes, but hit the majority of, of what he wanted was what won out and passed both houses. And Cullerton's plan could pass the Senate, but Madigan wouldn't let it pass the House. And so it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court then uh, voted it, uh, it down, threw it out, and now we're back to square one. Remember, this was the time that uh, Pat Quinn was pushing to get a solution too. He said he was, quote, put on earth to try to solve this. Uh, issue, but um, now we're at a, a crossroads where there hasn't really been a real effort to fix the pensions in a big way since this uh, failed and was thrown out by the Supreme Court. Well, Ray, one of the th the things that jumps out of out of your book is just. Um... Just the enormous uh, political, actually, gamesmanship that has gone on in the budget front in Illinois. And I just, you know, as you read, you know, people proposing temporary tax hikes and then sunsets and then reimposing it, it just feels like so much time and energy has been exerted in constructing partial solutions, kicking the can down the road. I mean, and I know when you're in there day to day, you sort of follow the machinations of each proposal. but. I mean, I guess when I when I finished your book, I was thinking this is part of the problem that so much time and energy has been expended on kind of skirting around the problem rather than confronting it. Right. I believe what they keep in mind is that they have to run for re-election in the House every two years. And so if they came in with, say, a grandiose plan to try to pub, uh, to plug the pension a whole, then they, that would include uh, high levels of tax increases. And they're trying to uh, avoid uh, taking tough votes that could come back to haunt them when people go to the polls. And so that is part of the issue. And there's just uh, more 
emphasis on by individual legislators on self-preservation rather than looking to the future to fix the big problems that the state has hanging for years and years. Right. Well, Ray, one of your most uh, terrific chapters is the one on Lisa Madigan. Um, Lisa Madigan, the speaker's daughter, um, was elected to the state Senate in 98. In 2002, was elected attorney general where she served until 24 um, terms. Um, but in 2013, it looked like she was poised to challenge Pat Quinn in the primary for governor. And then in July of 2013, according to your book, she issued this statement, just two sentences, let me read it. I feel strongly that the state would not be well served by having a governor and speaker from the same family and never plan to run for governor if that would be the case. With Speaker Madigan planning to continue in office, I will not run for governor. And then let me just quickly say that you 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 cite that a couple of weeks later, Madigan, Speaker Madigan was buttonholed, I think, at the Union League Club before a, a talk, and someone said, you know, what's going on between you and your daughter? And he says, Lisa and I have spoken about that on several occasions, and she knew very well that I did not plan to retire. She knew what my position was. She knew. Talk about the the, the relationship uh, between the speaker and um, and his daughter, and just, I mean, and particularly how it affected her political career. Well, uh, Lisa Madigan uh, was a bright politician. She looked like she had a bright future. And of course, she had the, the Madigan machine, the political machine behind her. So uh, she was able to get a leg up in getting into politics. But then she uh, went out and, and uh, did many things that uh, the public uh, viewed as positive, and uh, she was uh, a popular politician winning by big votes after she got in the first time in a real Donnybrook with uh, DuPage uh, State's Attorney Joe Burkett. But um, she uh, clearly looked like she was headed toward uh, the governorship to become the first uh, female governor of Illinois. It, it just looked like she was being groomed for that. And uh, the uh, like I said, she was popular and she was raising money at a pace faster than Pat Quinn, who was the incumbent. And uh, it looked like uh, this would be her time, that her time had come, that the stars were aligned, etc. But um, she also had uh, suffered a, a variety of, of uh, political hits over the years uh, because uh, of her ties with her dad, who was this powerful politician and the most powerful in Illinois. And a lot of people wondered how the speaker would react with his daughter saying, no, you can't do that, or how she would react when he would uh, go into battle against her. And so there were a lot of questions about how this uh, family relationship would work out. But um, she uh, had plenty of time to think about it. And she eventually decided that uh, this would not be a good thing to have the two Madigans on top of the world in Illinois politics. And you quote her as, as attorney general, she swore in her father in 2019 uh, to be speaker again. It was as it turned out for the last time. And her words were, congratulations, you're the speaker again. Um, pretty easy to read a little resentment into that, uh, that uh, statement. It's just really hard to, to read what was going through her mind uh, when she said that, but it was certainly worth uh, noting in the book. Right. Well, let's talk about the fall and um, of the speaker. Um, and, you know, lots of things are in play, but it seems like from 2018 on, um, um, on the one hand, on, from his perspective, it's good. Uh, governor Pritzker wins, and so there's a Democratic governor in the mansion. But then the, the Me Too scandal erupts, and uh, the Speaker's office is implicated in being not perhaps the best environment for, for women. Um, and then the Commonwealth Edison uh, scandal, which ultimately took him down. So talk about those two developments um, as a you know, critical phases in ending his uh, political career. Yeah, the, the uh, Me Too issue really uh, took hold when there was a 
campaign worker in uh, Speaker Madigan's uh, political operation who uh, was being harassed by one of his uh, lieutenants uh, in his Chicago headquarters. Uh, that was Kevin Quinn. He was the brother of the alderman, Marty Quinn. Marty Quinn's Madigan's field general. Kevin Quinn had a a uh, high ranking, but uh, lesser position than Marty and answer to Marty. Marty was this uh, woman's uh, mentor, she said. Her name was Elena Hampton. She said she had thrown her life, uh, you know, her professional life into trying to help Democrats. She's a woman who grew up just outside of Springfield in a town uh, called Pleasant Plains. And she, um, uh, told uh, Kevin multiple times in texts that uh, she wanted him to stop making, uh, uh, asking her out or telling her that uh, she was smoking hot in a bikini. And uh, he had spotted her at a, on a Facebook post and saw that and made that comment and had consistently and repeatedly uh, tried to to uh, get her to go out with him or have a beer with him. And uh, she uh, very clearly in texts that I read, in fact, I, I broke the, the story, texts that I read that showed that uh, she had said, look, I want you to stop. This is a perfect, I just want a professional relationship. And, and uh, he didn't stop. She eventually went to his brother, Marty, and then he did stop. And then she uh, quit the organization. She said she was uh, uh, offered a job as a precinct captain in Madigan's uh, ward, which is you know one of the ep epitome of political jobs for a, a, a foot soldier in uh, the democratic machine. Uh, but she said that uh, she turned it down because she didn't want to be involved with coming into the headquarters and seeing Kevin again. So she eventually left, went to a uh, uh, campaign for Marie Newman, who was a congressional candidate running against then uh, Congressman Dan Lipinski. And the Lipinskis and Madigans have had a long time relationship. Uh, so she didn't do any uh, favors for herself by going there. But then she eventually left that organization, not clear why there's a non disclosure agreement there. But she went and uh, wrote the speaker a letter explaining why she had left. Madigan. Uh, uh, sent one of his law lawyers out there to uh, talk to her. And uh, eventually, um, uh, Elena Hampton said that uh, she wanted to get back in the organization, but she felt that she was retaliated against and blackballed from the organization. And she eventually filed suit. All of this kind of uh, erupted during the 2018 spring session and it had a, a lingering effect where many many people uh who are lawmakers particularly women uh were looking for solutions to improve the culture uh, under madigan and at the general in assembly in springfield under the capitol dome in general and so uh they did some things that they called reform, but they didn't go far enough and said they needed to do more. Madigan, but uh, during this spring, had not only fired Kevin Quinn, but he had um, fired his chief of staff at the end when a clerk uh, had uh, held a press conference in Chicago and said uh, Tim Mapes had created all kinds of of problems uh, uh, culturally and harassment and uh, uh, sexual harassment type comments, all of which he has denied. Mapes has now been charged in federal court in the ComEd uh, scandal for uh, allegedly lying to a grand jury. But uh, this 2018 harassment scandal continued to linger. Uh, Madigan was able to survive that 
uh, and even picked up a seat, got the highest number of, of lawmakers uh, that he ever had on his side was 74, uh, 44 split. But then um, the ComEd case broke in 2020, in July 2020, and uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, reached a, an agreement, uh, a deferred prosecution agreement with ComEd. ComEd admitted that it had uh, put a variety of Madigan cronies onto its payroll, some in jobs that required little or no work. They had uh, run a bunch of interns into their program, paid internships uh, from families in uh, the speaker's 13th ward. And they had uh, agreed to put a person that Madigan backed on ComEd's board of directors. This is a state regulated utility. And so um, they wanted to do all that, they said, they had acknowledged so that Madigan would look favorably upon them and their legislative agenda. Now, ComEd did really well. And in 2011, they passed a big package that uh, changed the way they do rates. They had a formula rate that has been controversial. Some say it has been too lucrative for the company. They overhauled their grid system. And in 2016, uh, they had a, a proposal that passed that saved the nuclear plants and places like uh, Clinton and the Quad Cities and the thousands of jobs that went with it. And uh, that also cost ratepayers more money uh, to keep those uh, positions and jobs in place. But those were pieces of legislation, among other issues, that uh, went uh, ComEd's way. And uh, the speaker had this hanging over him during the 2000 election. And of course, uh, the Republicans had always been waiting for some type of, of uh, way to really uh, weigh Madigan down and weigh Madigan's baggage into other races. And two major things happened. Uh, Madigan was tied, Madigan and his baggage was tied into uh, Governor Pritzker's effort to raise the income tax on the folks with the biggest paychecks. And um, that failed. And then uh, Speaker Madigan had continued to support the Supreme Court Justice Thomas Kilbride, who he had supported in the first two times he ran for 10 year terms. Kilbride was running for retention, not against somebody, but retention where you need 60% to get uh, to keep your seat for another 10 years. And uh, he failed to get 60%. There was a, a vitriolic campaign against him where Madigan and Kilbride were tied together and uh, that hurt Kilbride's uh, ability to, to run and secure that seat for another 10 years. And uh, the, uh, the rank and file in Madigan's uh, caucus were starting to revolt. Uh, there had been uh, uh, lawmakers, including Stephanie Kifowit, who had uh, initially, after the July 20th ComEd agreement with the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and ComEd, by the way, paid a $200 million fine, and uh, Kifowit said that was enough. She was going to run against him. Later, other people said they wouldn't vote for him. Later, other people said that they would run against him. Eventually, there were 19 mostly women who decided that they would not support uh, Speaker Madigan for another term. And he couldn't break that block. And eventually, he uh, pulled out of the race and got dethroned. And as you know, uh, Speaker Welch is now the first African-American uh, Speaker of the House in Illinois history. Well, let's let's reflect on on Michael Madigan's legacy. In fact, you write um, Madigan's career could be a tragedy worth worthy of the classics. He rode old school politics to the mountaintop and lived at the height of power for decades. Madigan sought capitulation on budgets legislation, prominent projects, and discrete deals, 
all in the name of building a reputation of strength and consolidating one of the most formidable political organizations in the nation. He put winning over ideology. He demanded the fanatical loyalty. He demanded fanatical loyalty and got it. He outworked, outmaneuvered, and outlasted anyone who got in his way. And then you say he had more impact on Illinois than any other politician in the last half century. For better or for worse, he put his thumbprint on virtually every issue big or small still really early days but how do you uh, how do you think about the legacy of of speaker madigan well I, I think that's a question that we won't know the final answer to until we see how his uh federal case comes down as you know he's been charged with 22 count he's been charged in a 22 count indictment with one of his longtime friends and a comed lobbyist named Mike McLean, who was a, a legislator who has known Madigan since the 1970s. And so uh, I think what will have to determine and what will actually help determine his legacy is how that case turns out. He uh, has yet to have a trial date set, but uh, he's already spent from his campaign front more than $8 million in putting up a, a defense. And so uh, what we have to do is see some of the good things that he did, some of the questionable things that he did, and then uh, see what happens in this trial to really get the full impact and full legacy that uh, can be finally written in the end. I will say that, I, and you mentioned this in the book, that I think it was on February 18th, 2021, as he's resigning from the House, he gave a long st statement about, uh, you know, his his legacy and talked about what he th thought he accomplished for working people, um, health care, education and so forth. So people are seeking, you know, a, a, at least a kind of a, a way to sort of think what Madigan's case uh best case for himself is they might look at that statement um ray let's go to some questions that have been sent in there's some some terrific questions and one of them comes from um um from thomas in uh in um, it's twitter <coughs> excuse me it's twitter so i don't know where thomas is from but he, he wants to know about uh, speaker madigan's property tax business um and how that uh is implicated in the uh the, the the charges and the investigation by the Justice Department. Yes, there's a uh, it's a a story that's not easy to do quickly, but I'll try my best. And basically, there was property in Chinatown, and which is a neighborhood in Chicago, and uh, that was owned by the state. Uh, they needed to. There was a developer uh, who was looking to to put uh, property there, build uh, some type of building. It might have been a hotel, I can't remember for sure, but uh, they, there was a developer who wanted that property. It needed to be transferred to the city first and then changed with zoning uh, at the city to allow for the development. And Madigan became aware of this by uh, early on by talking uh, to people who knew the developer, and I believe the developer himself. And uh, eventually uh, he had, the allegation is that he had worked to get the, the legislation uh, crafted that would help transfer this property to the city uh, and the city hall, uh, city council zoning chair was a, was a, a Alderman Solis, who has Danny Solis, who has been uh, in, uh, implicated, but was a whistleblower and a mole and who wore a wire that really has led to many of these charges against Madigan and against another alderman, Ed Burke. But um, the uh, overall, when even though you, the idea was through the allegation that this development would occur and Madigan's office would then get uh, the property tax appeal business. And uh, so in short, what they're saying is that Madigan worked allegedly to uh, clear some legislation to get 
moved to Chicago so that he could uh, eventually get the uh, tax business of, of this developer of a major project. He, uh, Madigan has a, a top flight property tax appeals firm. And uh, the allegation is that he was trying to work that so that he would be able to eventually get the business. Right. Valeria from Rockford says, do you think Madigan changed for the worse over the years? Um, which I guess is a wonderful way of teeing up, you know, did he change over the years? Did he become, um, was it sure the notion of, of holding and retaining power became sort of an end unto itself? I know as a reporter, you don't like to make those judgments, but what does your reporting suggest on that front? Well, it's really hard to, to know um, what he was doing behind the scenes all, all the time. There aren't allegations uh, by the feds that he had done uh, anything before like 2011, the uh, the bribes for favors scandal that uh, is involving ComEd involves a period of uh, approximately from 2011 to 2019. But uh, he was always a calculating politician. Uh, it, there is not anything on the board about that would show that there's evidence that he did anything uh, untoward or allegations that he did anything untoward before then. Did he do things that were coy? Did he do things that were uh, uh, politically sly? Did he uh, run up to the edges or, or know the rules so well that he knew how to play them? Yes. Um, uh, but in Illinois, uh, there are there's uh, basically uh, an unwritten rule that, you know, there are things that are legal and illegal, but they, but they may not be uh, measured correctly or the same as whether somebody looks at it from a moral perspective. So there are things that are morally uh, good or bad, but there are things that are legal and illegal and they don't necessarily, necessarily correspond. Or poorly. You know, Ray, as I read your book, I was thinking about um, Madigan in the context of both um, George Ryan, former governor, former Secretary of State, and Dan Rostenkowski as um, the former powerful chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee in Washington, as, as sort of embodiment of politicians who sort of started out with a, one set of rules and expectations that obtained, and then they had long careers, and by the end of their careers, they're living in a different era, and maybe we're not able to to recognize the uh, the changing norms or make adjustments. I mean, do you have a thought on that? Well, I think I think there are some threads of of uh, similarities in that. Uh, clearly, Madigan had not been prepared for the Me Too movement. Clearly, he had not uh, set up a, enough of a strong human relations type of agency within his operations to uh, prepare for changing attitudes culturally. And so um, he, he uh, suffered politically from that. And um, whether he uh, got caught from changing lines or where the lines were drawn or whether it was more sophisticated uh, uh, wiretapping abilities uh, or more sophisticated efforts by the feds, it's hard to tell. But um, he, he's a guy who had retained power doing things the same way for years and years and years and didn't adapt to all the changes. I mean, you know, he didn't really have a big internet presence, for example, or social media presence. And that's been developing for, you know, decades now. Um, but uh, he's a guy who found what worked and had people play the game the way he wanted it played to get elected and to get reelected and to try to, uh, keep his power. Well, one of the questions you ask a couple points in the book, uh, you know, what is the speaker thinking? Um, and I'm wondering if you might be able to, um, to kind of 
speculate in the realm of his legal strategy. You've done some terrific reporting on the, the case that's developing. And I think you had an article a few weeks ago where you said that the Madigan's lawyers said they needed to review millions and millions of documents you know, before any kind of trial. As I read that, I was wondering if the Madigan team was signaling to the feds that we are going to fight this with, you know, with all the resources we have. And uh, so be prepared for a long fight. I mean, do you think there's some signaling that maybe of a plea agreement or how do you read that? Boy, I don't I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but um, he's putting in uh, the fact that he's put in $8 million into, into the uh, firm that uh, is handling his defense signals to me that he's in for a long fight and that it's not going to, that he, there's no, no reason to believe that he would cave at any point on this. He has said repeatedly he's done nothing wrong and that uh, he does not believe that he has done anything more than uh, recommend people for for jobs to ComEd, for example. And it, he um, sounds like a guy who's going to fight it to the end and try to fight to prove himself innocent. Let me ask you just sort of finally, Ray, in terms of uh, of your work, are you uh, do you have another book uh, looming in the distance? Um, I, I suspect when you do your, you know, maybe a paperback version of this, you'll have more information. But is there something else? And I asked that as I was as I was reading your book, I was thinking, boy, I'd love to read Ray's book on Big Jim Thompson. <laughs> any any inkling to do something like that? You know, I've thought about that. That is one big task. He was in the office for 14 years and I didn't cover the entire 14 years. I think it would have to be a multi-person uh, effort to try to pull that together, but it would be worth it for sure because he was such a great uh, intellect, but he was also a guy who was a Republican governor, a moderate voice, smart as a whip, and somebody who could work with Democrats. And so uh, we could use uh, more people like Jim Thompson around today, um, but the uh, the task, the monumental task of trying to pull off a book on Jim Thompson would be daunting to say the least. Well, final question, Ray, for, for students out there, what do you tell them when they ask you about careers in journalism? Uh, tell us about the ledger. I mean, obviously you've had a lot of fun and you've done amazing work. How do you, how do you reflect on your career? Well, my thought is that if you work hard and you do good work, you're eventually going to find a place that you can uh, do what you want to do. Uh, the job climate is so much different from what it was when I started. Uh, the papers had more uh, numbers of journalists in their newsroom. They had more uh, reporters, they had more copy editors, they had more, more editors, um, and uh, there have been layoffs and uh, papers have been reduced in size, including the Tribune. Um, but if you want to do it and you really believe in it, you can't beat it as a profession because, number one, you really can't find a place that's much more exciting than uh, in a newsroom when you've got a big scoop going or there's a big story that the whole newsroom is is uh, working on. So uh, I would say go for it. Uh, don't be discouraged. There are more outlets uh, popping up every day and you can do good journalism. In fact, the Tribune just won a Pulitzer Prize by combining work with uh, reporters from the Tribune and uh, the Better Government Association, which is a nonprofit that does journalistic endeavors themselves, and they combined and just won the, a Pulitzer a couple of weeks ago. So uh, there are other places besides uh, the traditional newspapers and uh, radio stations and TV stations to find uh, journalism jobs, and you can move around. Once you make a decision, you don't have to stay in one place forever. Just go for it. If you believe it in your heart, do it. 
Great. Well, Ray, thank you for such a terrific conversation. And I would tell our, our viewers, this is a really remarkable book that is effectively Illinois Politics 101. I mean, the speaker has been at the center of, of America or Illinois life for 40, four decades, 40 years. And you just, uh, it's a wonderful account of of Illinois politics as it's unfolded. So, so Ray, thank you so much for the great conversation. And we would love to coerce you into, coax you, I'll say, rather than coerce you, <laughs> into come down to Carbondale and meet with students and talk to classes, meet with the community members. Sheila Simon says hello. She's she's, <laughs> she's mentioned some rumblings about a band that you're involved with that she uh, would uh, like to talk to you about. So, <laughs> Well, one time at the State Fair, her band came up there and I sat in on a number of uh, I don't think her her uh, band, which I believe was called Loose Gravel, ever recovered from my appearance, but <laughs> it's good to hear her say something uh, nice like that. Um, I would love to come down and, and talk to your students. Uh, so uh, let's uh, see if we can work something out soon. Great. Well, thanks, Ray, and we will stay in touch. And thank you for joining the series. Thanks to all of you. We'll have this video on our website tomorrow. Show it to family and friends. And thanks for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.